on the ground or up a tree. You never know quite where they'll be. Oh, I will put you in my mushroom basket. Sorted carefully in my mushroom basket. I will put you in my mushroom basket. So don't try to hide. Don't try to hide. You are destined for my mushroom pot. Some of you will make a tasty stock. Oh, here's a mushroom that I must not eat. Here's a mushroom that I must not eat. Take a photograph, but do not eat. So don't try to hide. Don't try to hide. On the ground or up a tree. You never know quite where they'll be. Oh, I will put you in my mushroom basket. Sort it carefully in my mushroom basket. I will put you in my mushroom basket. So don't try to hide. Don't try to hide. You are destined for my mushroom pot. Some of you will make a tasty stock. Oh, here's a mushroom that I must not eat. Here's a mushroom that I must not eat. Take a photograph, but do not eat. So don't try to hide. fringe on the so this is this right here is just about perfect this right here is just about perfect perfect about perfect about perfect this right here is just about perfect this right here is just about perfect this right here is just about perfect walking through the woods but it'll also help you move stuff around to be able to see the mushrooms Hi, everyone, and welcome to Night School. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Lynn from the Nightlife Programming Team. And I'm Christina, the producer behind these virtual nightlifes. While we're sheltering in place, we're bringing Nightlife Programming to you every week with virtual nightlife and night school. Tonight's night school is all about fungi. Over the past few years, our Fungus Among Us nightlife has been one of our most popular themes, and we're excited to bring it to you on the virtual stage. We have a great lineup tonight. Uh, we have Dr. Gordon Walker, who you may know better as Fascinated by Fungi on Instagram and TikTok. We have Maya Elson, who's the director of Co-Renewal, who will help you think like a fungus and talk about how fungi can assist with ecological regeneration. And we have William Padilla Brown, who's doing amazing things with cordyceps breeding and who will also be performing a song from his new album because he's really good at music too. Um, and finally, we have Peter McCoy of Radical Mycology, sharing the art of Radical Mycology mixtape 
which you heard a little bit of before we came on screen. And I saw a lot of you asking about that adorable mushroom song, which he will talk about later. So stay tuned. It's our favorite song too. It is. Uh, tonight's program is live. So please feel free to ask questions and share comments in the chat. I think that's it for now. Um, enjoy. Mushrooms are so cool. They're just endlessly out there in nature. They're ephemeral, they're ethereal. They, they come up, they disappear. They're beautiful colors, they're wonderful textures. It's a thing that's around us all the time. We're standing on my ceiling. We're standing on the bodies of mushrooms right now, but we're not seeing the fruiting bodies right now. And that's, that's so cool to me that there's sort of hidden cryptic life all around us all the time. This is Gordon Walker. He's a biochemistry PhD, a wine and fermentation consultant, and he really likes fungi. What else we got back here? So this is a Dyer's polypore, Lactaria xanthodermis. A lexinum species? Oh, there's one you stepped on. Oh, oh shit. Right there oh, that's a lacaria. Don't worry about that. I'm not sure this is a Pluteus. This is probably a Cortinarius. He's also, like, kind of famous. His Instagram account, Fascinated by Fungi, has over 50,000 followers. He brought me to his favorite foraging spot two hours north of San Francisco to help me understand why a crop of new fungi-based meat startups could soon compete with established players like Impossible and beyond. Hi guys, I'm Gordon. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, we'll be speaking tonight on mushrooms. There we go. Uh, so this is my logo, uh, Fascinated by Fungi. Uh, it is sort of inspired by my passion for mushrooms. I worked with an artist, uh, Chris Oxley, to kind of bring one of these Arkham Bolo faces to life, but with mushrooms. Um, I've had a lot of people tell me that this is somewhat terrifying, but I hope it's also somewhat fascinating. Uh, I sort of just had the idea that I wanted to construct my face with all these various mushroom bits. Um, so I hope you guys enjoy it. But uh, Fastened by Fungi is a sort of social media platform that I adopted uh, to help share my passion and my interest in mushrooms with people. It came about while I was living in New Zealand with my partner. She was working 12 hour shifts at a winery and I got bored. So I started going hiking and it was a particularly wet year in New Zealand and there was just mushrooms everywhere. And I'd been fascinated by fungi as a kid, but had sort of forgotten about it for like 20 years. And suddenly I found myself, you know, down on the ground, all these weird angles, trying to take pictures of mushrooms to figure out what the heck they were. And after about a month, I had hundreds of mushroom photos on my phone and no idea what to do with all of them. So I started posting some of them to Instagram and I found this really amazing community of people uh, where I got great feedback, advice on IDs, insights into biology, the chemistry, all sorts of stuff. And that has sort of blossomed over the years to um, all these different social media sites. Uh, TikTok has been an especially fun one because I get to do a lot of videos and it's a little more interactive. Um, definitely a big shout out to iNaturalist and that's that's my favorite app for helping to ID mushrooms and helping to track my finds and that is actually from the Academy itself. Uh, so I highly recommend everyone using iNaturalist for any of your naturalist needs. Um, but let's hop into it. Let's talk about mushrooms and kind of, I'm going to give you a brief overview of everything I can in about 20 minutes. So we'll see how far we get. So I'm trying to put mushrooms in sort of an evolutionary context. We got to think a little bit about life in general. Uh, so there are three main domains of life. There's bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And within eukarya, there are multiple kingdoms, um, things we're more familiar with like animals and plants and fungi, but fungi have always been sort of overlooked. And that is, uh, that is because they are frequently invisible, right? You, you don't see mushrooms when they're out there. They are present, but unless the fruiting body is there, it's otherwise completely invisible to you. Um, and in fact, it wasn't until the 70s that, that fungi even were recognized as their own kingdom. Before that, people kind of just lumped them in together with plants, but they are distinctly very different from plant evolutionary and metabolically in that plants are fixing uh, sugars using the energy of the sun and chlorophyll to turn carbon dioxide into sugars, whereas mushrooms are eating stuff. They're catabolic, so they're like animals in that they're digesting their food. Um, in an overall sense, um, I think mushrooms are often ignored, like I talked about. You know, there's sort of this little little branch here, even though they're an entire kingdom of this huge, beautiful tree of life. And mushrooms are 
kind of closely related to animals or not closely related, that's, that's a misnomer. They are more related to animals than they are to plants. And that's to say that animals and fungi both use a polysaccharide called chitin. So insects and mollusks and uh, some other organisms will use chitin in their exoskeletons and their shells. Uh, and fungi use chitin in their, in their cell walls as well. Um, generally, when we're going to talk about mushrooms, I'm going to focus on Basidiomycota and Ascomycota. There are other, other phylum of fungi that are super interesting, but they don't produce the large fruiting bodies or the mushrooms that we're used to seeing. Um, so let's talk about some sort of fungal life strategies. Uh, there are saprophytic fungi. So these are mushrooms that are digesting uh, the organic matter. So they're living in their food, whether it be soil or wood or whatever substrate they're, they're living in and on it. Um, there are parasitic mushrooms. So those are mushrooms that are preying on a, a plant or another fungi. And there are mycorrhizal mushrooms that live sort of in some, in some symbiosis and live uh, in concert with plants. And it, honestly, 90% of the plants on the planet have some sort of fungal partner. So this is a very common type of association. And there's even mushrooms that will shift from being mycorrhizal to being saprophytic. So if you know a mushroom is growing with this tree and, and helping the tree absorb water, absorb nutrients, it's got this great symbiosis. If the tree happens to die for another reason, that mushroom might turn around and eat the tree. So it's eating what it was previously living on. It's, the mushrooms are kind of metal like that. But uh, there are, as I mentioned, two main um, sort of subdivisions of mushrooms. There's uh, basidiomycetes and ascomycetes. So basidiomycetes make up the majority of the gilled mushrooms that we're familiar with, large, pretty, you know, visible mushrooms. Ascomycetes are generally a little bit smaller. Um, there's some weird ones like morels and truffles in there. The biggest difference is that basidia are sort of these big uh, club-like structures with spores on the end of them. And ascomycetes instead have an ascus, which is sort of just like a bubble or a, a sphere that is filled with the spores. Um, mushrooms live as dicaryotes, so they have two copies of their genome. Uh, they will sporulate and release the spores in the environment, um, and that's part of how they are doing their life cycle. And do sexual reproduction, you can also do clonal asexual reproduction. And there's even some mushrooms that can do both at the same time. Um, this is a dendrocolibia, it's a cool little mushroom that grows on degrading russulas. And from the cap, it releases sexual spores. And then from the stipe, these little nubs uh, release asexual spores. So it's kind of doing both at the same time. It's a way to hedge your bets uh, from a genetic standpoint. So I want to draw the distinction between mushroom versus mycelium. Uh, mycelium is really the body of the mushroom, the, the fungi that's living in the substrate, the soil, or the, or the dirt that we, we think about. And that's what's cryptic. We don't see that most of the time. What we see is when that mycelium has absorbed enough nutrients and environmental conditions are, are favorable, it will make the decision to fruit and put up a mushroom. And that mushroom is very akin to like a, a flower or a fruit that you would see on a, on a plant. Uh, and much, much like on a plant, if you remove the mushroom, you don't necessarily kill the plant. You're just removing, you know, one thing from the environment. And this is, this is the, the spore bearing fruiting body of the mushroom. Um, and so that's, that's important to kind of keep in mind the regenerative, the, the vegetative versus the, the reproductive phase of these mushrooms. Um, but this mycelium is, is really interesting stuff. It's made of these hyphal, hyphal cells. These are fungal cells that are sort of like finger-like projections. And they are complex in terms of the, the components in their membranes. Um, there's manoproteins, there's glucans, there's phospholipid membranes. They're not that dissimilar from an animal cell, um, but these fungal membranes and these hypha in particular are incredibly adaptable. and can even be weaponized to attack plants. And that's a really important part of how mushrooms do their stuff. So there's an incredible diversity of different mushroom uh, morphologies that are out there. There are things like truffles and these hypogeus fungi that live underground. They do that as sort of an adapt adaptation when uh, moisture is sort of limiting. They don't want to dry out, so they, they form a little fruiting body underground, but you'll never be able to spread your spores if you're stuck underground. So these truffles have adopted the ability to create uh, an incredible diversity of smells that are very appealing to animals. So animals will come dig them up and help them disperse their spores. Uh, there's some of the ascomycetes, the morels and the cup fungi and some of these club fungi that I mentioned. Um, Basidiomycetes really have the broadest range of different morphologies that are out there. You have 
gills and pores and teeth and stink horns and little bird's nest fungi and all sorts of stuff that are just amazing. Go on my page if you want to look at, you know, the diversity of all the different morphologies that are out there. But it's incredible because mushrooms have a capacity to um, be closely related, but look completely different. And sort of the, the opposite where you have convergent evolution, where things come from different evolutionary lineages, and they end up looking very similar. Gills have been evolved multiple times. Pores have been evolved multiple times, as have uh, corals and clubs and all sorts of stuff. There's morphologies because there's only a limited number of ways where it's efficient to disperse spores. So mushrooms have figured out again and again, like some of these morphologies that work for them. Um, so let's talk a little bit about fungal life strategies. Uh, I mentioned mycorrhizal mushrooms. This is where you have the mushroom and the plant kind of working in symbiosis together. Um, the, the plant is providing sugar and the mushroom is providing a lot of surface area on the roots and really helping with uptake of, of water, of nutrients, um, helping to sequester certain things that might be, you know, detrimental to the plant. Uh, it's a pretty incredible relationship. And there's a lot of really good edible mushrooms that we think about, chanterelles, porcinis, uh, black trumpets, all sorts of stuff are, are mycorrhizal mushrooms. And then we have, uh, we have endophytes. So these are incredible fungi that live inside of the mushroom cells, oh, sorry, <laughs> inside of the plant cells. Um, in between, plant cells actually have gaps in between them, and, and often fungi will live between those gaps uh, with bacteria as well. And that is a big part of, of research that's going on in crop sciences right now to better, better understand the interactions between endophytes and their hosts and how that affects the metabolism of the plant. Uh, we have full parasitism, stuff like armillaria or honey mushrooms. So these are uh, mushrooms that are very strong parasitic mushrooms. They can uh, weaponize their hyphae to girdle a tree, um, create meadows. It's, it's kind of a ecological thing, ecological disturbance. We'll think about that a little bit later, but where fungi and plants um, don't see eye to eye, there are things like uh, wheat lacoche or corn smut, uh, cedar apple rust. These are some very strange looking fungi that infect plants. Um, there are also fungi that infect other fungi. So you have molds like hypomyces or these little uh, powder top mushrooms that don't infect big old moldy mushrooms. I see those back in the East Coast. And there's even plants that get in on this, uh, this thing where the plants are being parasitic on the mushroom. And those are called mycoheterotrophs. And those are plants that have tapped into the mycelium and are taking their, their sugars from the mushroom, but they're not doing any actual photosynthesis. So the sugars are coming from the host plant to the mushroom to this microheterotroph. And it was seen previously as always being parasitic, but we're seeing more and more that maybe these microheterotrophs actually are helping to establish the mycorrhizal networks and, uh, and kind of beat out competition. So it's pretty incredible all of the ecological webs and how they, they spin together when you think about the fungi kingdom. Uh, so mushrooms are survivors, right? As soon as they fruit, there's a whole bunch of stuff out there that is trying to eat them, uh, whether it's plants, or slugs, snails, insects. Um, there's incredible diversity of environmental factors that they have to deal with. Uh, and, you know, not to mention the, the human destruction of habitat. Um, but what I want to think about is, is really like a mushroom like a lion's mane here can, can be out in the environment for, for many weeks. And how does something that is so delectable and, and obviously, you know, in high demand by a lot of these creatures actually subsist for so long? And that's because mushrooms are full chock full of these bioactive compounds. So they have a whole range of polysaccharides like the beta-glucans, phospholipids, fatty acids, sterols, terpenes, polyketides, antioxidants, organic acids, lectins, uh, a huge range of, of compounds that are bioactive. And a lot of these compounds have antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, antibacterial, um, they are cytotoxic and that they can kill cells. So anything that is trying to eat these mushrooms might be ingesting some of these compounds. And certainly if you think about like the size of a mushroom versus a bug and a bug takes a bite of a mushroom, it, there might be very powerful effects on that bug system from uh, even a low concentration of some of these bioactive compounds. And it's something that, that we can think about because we have started, you know, human beings have started to capitalize on the incredible diversity of secondary chemistry that mushrooms do and looking at that for therapeutics and, and human health. Um, and that's, that's a big thing. We look at some of these beta-glucans, they can be absorbed in the lumen of the intestine, kind of chopped up and redistributed to your white blood cells in a way that really helps stimulate your immune system, stimulate its response, help to in inhibit pathogenic fungi, and potentially even inhibit cancer cells. So there's, there's incredible work happening with this. 
um, there's real potential for mushrooms to be used as a therapeutic. But unfortunately, we, we don't have that much clinical data yet either. So, you know, just be careful what, what you read. Always, always stick with the science. Um, it's a good time to talk about cordyceps. They are some of the most incredible looking mushrooms that are out there. Uh, these are very specific uh, mushrooms that prey on certain insect hosts. And there's a huge diversity of these in like the cloud forests of Ecuador and in South America. In North America, we don't have that many of them and there's not that many different relationships, at least not that many of them cataloged. Um, but these are mushrooms that will infect a bug take over its system by growing hyphae into the bug system, uh, affecting gene expression, and kind of taking over the mechanics of the bug, often causing it to walk upwards to a high point and release its spores to infect yet another generation. And there's just this incredible diversity of phenotypes for cordyceps out there. And I want to thank Damon, who I'm using his, his pictures because he has slogged around in the forests of Ecuador. I'm not quite that hardcore. Um, but cordyceps have gotten really popular in popular culture too because they were featured in the last of us a video game where a cordyceps mutated and started infecting humans creating sort of these crazy zombie things and i can assure you guys that there's probably no way that's going to ever happen because cordyceps are very specific to their insect hosts and I, I think making the jump to humans would be a little bit too much for them unless someone's doing some really crazy genetic engineering uh, but one of the really interesting things when i was mentioning the therapeutics is cordyceps have this molecule called cordycepin. And it looks a heck of a lot like adenosine, which is a nucleotide base. And if cordycepin is present in a cell and gets incorporated into an mRNA message, it terminates uh, the message. So it's actually a, a potential therapeutic that we can use to control really fast growing cells in our body. So we can use it to inhibit viruses and potentially cancer cells. So that's, that's some incredible stuff that cordyceps can do. And that's Again, sort of the, the intersection between pop culture and, uh, and all sorts of stuff. So. so fungi are ubiquitous and pervasive. They are everywhere at every interface in life. Um, they are in lichens, they are in the air, they are on surfaces. There's even you know, fungi that live in the water, which is pretty mind blowing to me. You won't see mushrooms, but they, there are fungi there. And because of their ability to be absolutely everywhere, uh, they're really good for bioremediation. And this is when you think about we have an ecosystem that has been wrecked uh, by human activities often enough, usually the spilling of hydrocarbons or other forms of pollutants. And you can get microbial transformation of mushrooms uptaking, sequestering, transforming some of these toxic compounds and hopefully helping to restore the ecosystem um, you know, in concert with bacteria and plants. And, and that's a really good thing. I, ideally, we can use mushrooms to kind of help save the world and, and restore some of the damage we've done um, but unfortunately, fungi can also have really detrimental effects. And this is going back to the idea of, you know, parasitic stuff. And there's a fungi called Phytophthora remorum, and it causes sudden oak death. Uh, so this is a disease that is ravaging California right now. And Phytophthora remora has a, um, a reservoir in California Bay Laurel. When it's near tan oak, it will jump to tan oak and it causes, it doesn't directly kill the tree, but it causes a massive uh, downregulation of the tree's immune system and ability to deal with stress. And so sudden oak death does eventually cause the death of these trees. And even though they're able to re-sprout, they never grow as big and never never get as strong. Um, so this disease is, is currently really changing the landscape of California forests. And the study of disturbance ecology is really looking at how factors like that, um, combined with stuff like fire and climate change, are affecting our ecosystems. And you know, we look towards the future and try to figure out what, what's gonna happen in our forests, what's gonna happen with our fungal populations or plant populations. Um, I think there'll be a little bit more about disturbance ecology later. Um, but we're also sort of on the edge of this mushroom cultivation revolution. Uh, we've been growing mushrooms for years in industrial settings for the incredible set of enzymes that they, they have. And we're also looking at more novel enzymes from fungi now for, for human health for uh, you know, bioremediation, for even just you know, stuff, your laundry detergent is full of fungal enzymes. Uh, there's a huge revolution in mycomaterials that's happening. So there's making packing materials. This high school student made a canoe that was pretty cool. Uh, there's companies making fabrics uh, in the Bay Area. We have Mycoworks and Bolt Threads that are both making sort of a mushroom leather kind of thing. Looking forward to somebody having a mushroom leather coat. That would be really cool. Maybe a mushroom couch. Uh, there's potential for therapeutics. So we've got a classic example of something like Taxol, which is a really, really important 
cancer drug that was derived from fungi. And you know, there's there's incredible potential for people to be helped by entheogenic substances and some of the psilocybe mushrooms and uh, helping people deal with depression and PTSD. It's there's there's a lot to be said for that. Um, my most favorite part of all this is eating mushrooms because I am very food motivated and I think that mushrooms are a delicious and super sustainable source of protein. And so I'm super excited about the kind of coming food revolution that I see uh, with sustainable fungal uh, foods of the future. Um, one that's been around for a long time is a, a product called corn, and that's actually produced from a mushroom, uh, well, Fusarium, which is a fungi. It's sort of grown in a, a giant bioreactor. And this is essentially what's called an airlift reactor. So it's a, a huge tube of media and cells are getting cycled up and down, um, creating bigger and bigger chunks of cells. Once they get big enough, they'll fall out and they're harvested, heat treated and packed into corn. Um, there's multiple other companies around doing similar things with different strains of fungi. There's Prime Roots, which is making some really cool bacon-like products. There's Meaty, which is using mycelium as well. Uh, there's Wild Earth, which is making a uh, dog food based on fungi. So those are all really cool sort of future food things. Um, but for, for the right here and now, there are incredible local farms growing some really good mushrooms. Uh, Far West Fungi and Mycopia are both local to the Bay Area, and they are incredibly sustainable, family-run farms. Um, I think if you think about the amount of water it takes to produce a pound of beef, it's something like 1,600 gallons for a pound of beef, where you can grow a pound of mushroom protein for probably about 12 gallons of water. So as we look forward to the future of climate change, I think we're gonna to have to reduce meat consumption. And for me, I think mushrooms are a perfect way to uh, help you know, kind of fill in the gaps. And they're delicious and nutritious and, and good for you. So thank you guys very much uh, for listening. Uh, my account, Fascinated by Fungi, is really focused on the phenology. So looking at mushrooms, you know, be aware of what's your environment, take a picture, throw it on INAT, um, send me a picture, see if I, I'm not always that great with IDs, but I'm always excited to see what you guys send. Um, Definitely into the photography element. You know, I don't have a fancy camera. I just use my phone, a little macro lens that I strap on. So don't feel like you need to buy something. You can just go out, go for a hike, get out there and, and see what's there. Uh, I like to cook a lot. I'm definitely, like I said, food motivated. So follow my stories. I do a lot of cooking. Um, the biochemistry and the ecology, I'm a, I have a science background. My background is actually in wine, but I found fungi to be incredibly interesting in all the same ways that I found wine interesting, that it it can capture a, a sense of time and place and is incredible uh, smells and taste and organoleptic properties. And, and sort of lastly, I'm, I'm really focused on, on mushroom education. I want to I wanna help people become more passionate about mushrooms. I want to help them dispel some of the myths that are around mushrooms. And ultimately, I'd love to have a TV show where I could teach people about mushrooms all the time. And uh, I would love your guys' help and support in making that happen. So thank you very much for listening to me and, and letting me kick this off. I'm really excited to see the other presentations tonight. Thanks guys. Hi, I'm Maya Elson. Um, it's wonderful to be here with you all. I'm super excited to talk to you all and um, share some of the work that Coronal is doing. Uh, let me just share my screen here. Um, let me just get this going. Great. So um, a little bit about me. Um, I'm the executive director of Co-Renewal, which is a small nonprofit that's currently focused on community-led uh, mycological solutions to pollution and fire-affected ecosystems uh, with a strong focus on social and environmental justice. <clears throat> I also do um, mushroom hikes in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, I lead uh, eco-psychology and micro-psychology workshops. Um, I uh, work for a nature-based rite of passage program called uh, Gaia pa Passages. And I'm also a mom of a very enchanted child. Um, I uh, am going to be talking about a lot of different topics tonight. Um, and if you're interested in any of this stuff, um, you can uh, check out carbonewal.org. Um, I'll also be giving a talk on August 25th at 4 p.m. Um, that's going to expand on a lot of the topics that I'll be covering tonight. So um, I wanted to invite you all to take a moment and think like a fungus with me. Um, so I know a lot of us have been looking at the screen a lot. And um, if you want, you can just close your eyes. 
and take a breath, take a moment for yourself, and imagine that you are a web of mycelium growing underground, just like Gordon was explaining to us. We're, we're feeling around, we're trying to find food, we're, we're sensing there's some water over here, we're growing, we're expanding, and we come across a new substance that we haven't seen before. And uh, it's actually something that could harm us. Um, it's oil pollution. And we send out one of our tendrils uh, to sense it and get to know it a little bit. Then we bring that tendril back in. And uh, then we go through this process of dipping into our genetic past to see what our ancestors uh, might have uh, dealt with that might be similar to this, that we could adapt to this situation. And so we combine our, um, our mycelial ancestral wisdom together uh, with our understanding of the current situation. And we're able to transform this thing that's very toxic into food for ourselves, um, and then for, uh, into soil for our environment. Um, so if you want, you can open your eyes now. Um, so I think that there's a lot that we can learn from this as humans. Um, I'm really interested in how uh, we can connect with the ancestors of the land that we inhabit and that we seek to heal and how we can bring that together with cutting edge science. Um, I'm also really interested in how we can bring together inner remediation with outer remediation. So inner remediation being, you know, uh, the ways that toxic civilization affects our minds and bodies um, and outer remediation being the work that we do in our landscapes. <clears throat> um, so I actually think that these two things are inextricably linked. And when we bring them into alignment, we have this incredible potential to turn this very toxic situation that we're in to, into something that feeds our resilience. Um, so this is the kind of work that Co Renewal seeks to do. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our projects. The first project I wanted to tell you about um, is in Ecuador and a little bit of context here. So uh, in the 1950s and 60s, um, Texaco, which is now owned by Chevron, um, left billions of gallons of oil all around um, the eastern region of Ecuador in the Sucumbios um, area. Uh, and they've refused to clean it up. And um, in this uh, pollution is still there and desperately needs to be cleaned up. Um, in addition, <clears throat> there's uh, been more recent pollution um, because there's uh, all of this old uh, infrastructure of pipelines uh, moving throughout the landscape um, and they uh, will inevitably fail as we know pipelines do. And uh, just in April, about 15,000 barrels of crude oil spilled into two major rivers um, in the Amazon, uh, the uh, Coca River and the Napo River. So um, this oil pollution has pretty massive impacts on uh, the local indigenous communities um, with really high rates of cancer and birth defects and a host of um, health issues. Um, it's also, as you can imagine, really affecting the biodiversity of the region. Um, and right now, uh, with the pandemic hitting this region so hard, um, it's been incredibly challenging for a lot of these communities um, in this region to be able to access clean water that's safe. So um, what we at Co Renewal are doing right now is um, we've got this fungi and petroleum contamination project. And what we're trying to understand is um, to get a baseline understanding of the native microbial communities that are in these oil contaminated areas in order to inform our remediation strategies. So essentially what that means is we wanna see what the fungi and bacteria and other microbes that are growing in these oil pits are already doing to clean up the mess um, and transform um, you know, petroleum into soil um, and how we can work with them to uh, support that process happening. So right here you see this picture of this Tremedes that I took um, it, that is in a, an oil pit. Um, that log is right there. Um, and so uh, these are what we call petrophilic fungi, which are fungi that grow um, in petroleum. 
So part of our project is setting up sample plots. Um, part of it is characterizing and identifying these um, petrophilic fungi. Part of it is uh, studying the extracellular enzymatic activities of the fungi and, and uh, their genetics, um, and then culturing the fungi so we could grow them um, and use them in future projects. Um, we're collaborating with an organization called UDAPT, um, which is a, an organization that's been around for a long time doing incredible work on the front lines, um, seeking justice for the people of Ecuador versus um, Chevron. <clears throat> and um, we're also supporting some work that they're doing um, with indigenous communities and with youth um, to do a grassroots bioremediation work um, in this area. Uh, we also work with the Universidad San Francisco de Quito and uh, UC Riverside on this project. Um, so I want to switch gears and actually switch continents as well and bring us uh, up to California, which I imagine many of you are here. Um, and uh, if um, you recall, before the pandemic, we were all really freaked out about wildfires, and uh, some of us still are. Um, and these wildfires are getting worse um, and they are also getting more frequent. Um, and uh, I think this fire season is not looking super great, um, unfortunately. So how did we get here? Um, well, it's a long story, it's a complicated story and I don't have time to share it all with you tonight, but um, some little tidbits of it um, are that when the Spaniards arrived in 1542, um, as you may know, they committed incredible acts of genocide um, against the indigenous peoples of California. And um, there was a lot lost during that time, a lot of really important things lost, um, including traditional burning practices um, that the indigenous peoples of California would, would do. Um, and, you know, they had such sophisticated and complex and brilliant systems for working with fire and um, would know just when to burn uh, in just the right type of time of ha type of habitat in the right way with the right fuel um, at the right time of year. Um, and so much of that has been lost. And with that loss, um, the ecosystem has changed. Um, however, there are a lot of people who are still um, practicing this and bringing that back, which is very exciting. Um, so the oak trees um, are also an important species for um, the indigenous people of California and an incredibly crucial species for all sorts of wildlife um, and fungi. So if you're a mushroom hunter, like I am, um, you may know to like look under the oak trees for the, for the good mushrooms. Um, and what I've noticed as a mushroom hunter going out and looking for these mushrooms over the last few years is um, those mycorrhizal mushrooms that Gordon was talking about. So these are the ones that have a symbiotic relationship with plants. And they basically, their mycelium connects to the roots of the plant and expand that plant's uh, root system, give it more access to uh, water and food than it would have otherwise. Um, in exchange for glucose. So they have this beautiful symbiosis. Um, so I've seen a decline in those species, um, uh, like the chanterelles and the porcinis. And I've also seen a rise in the saprotrophic fungi, the decomposer fungi, um, and a big, a lot of buildup of woody debris. Um, it's, and it's interesting, actually. Um, I just read this incredible paper about how um, the uh, Ohlone people of the Bay Area would burn specifically to support um, edible fungi like chanterelles and porcinis. Um, so if we are thinking like a chanterelle here, you know, we're gonna do our best to take care of our oak tree, our mycorrhizal partner. Um, but if we don't have enough water, we're both gonna struggle a lot. And I think that's a big um, contributing factor to sudden oak death. And I also think that um, loss of fire and the fire being taken away from the ecosystem is a contributing factor to sudden oak death. Um, <clears throat> so um, we've got this buildup of forest fuel. Oh, and we also have um, cute little mushroom fairies that we sometimes see in the forest, as you can see here. Um, so it, it seems to me that the best way to deal with this situation is to have more prescribed burns um, <clears throat> and bringing back of the traditional burning methods. Um, and if you can't do that, there are a lot of really cool fire mimicry techniques um, that I recommend checking out. Um, you can also support tree health um, with mycorrhizal fungi. You can do saprotrophic fungal inoculation of trees that are a fire hazard. 
you can um, chip forest fire fuel. So in this picture, uh, you can see an oak tree that was uh, chipped and there are deer mushrooms, um, which were delicious. Um, you can also introduce biochar, which I think is a very interesting tool that holds a lot of potential, uh, but only if it's done well. Uh, oh, actually, I'm gonna go back to this. So if we don't do any of these things, um, we, uh, we end up with these catastrophic wildfires and these fires that are uh, too frequent, um, which, and then you combine that with a drought, you know, which is really just a shift towards a warmer and drier climate, um, invasive annual grasses and habitat destruction of all sorts, you end up with the situation that we're having with these big fires every year. Um, and as you can imagine, um, these mega fires have a much bigger impact on the trees and the fungi and the wildlife. Um, and it takes a lot longer for uh, the ecosystems to regenerate after these um, mega fires. Um, and it's particularly hard for the mycorrhizal fungi to come back. So this is my wonderful friend and colleague um, and mentor, Dr. Mia Maltz. Um, who is currently doing two really fascinating studies. Um, she is uh, working with Co Renewal and with UC Riverside and the Bureau of Land Management to help us develop some methods of promoting post-fire ecological regeneration with fungi. So uh, basically what she's looking at is how fire affects soil, plant, bacterial, and fungal communities and how we can reintroduce native mycorrhizal mushrooms um, to, oh my goodness, um, how we can, I hope you can see my slides down. Okay. Um, how we can reintroduce native mycorrhizal fungal spores in order to kickstart this process of ecological succession. Um, and, uh, if you, um, if you think about this, you know, if we have the mycorrhizal fungi and we have the trees, it's basically gonna get that process um, going and the uh, forest will be able to regenerate a lot more smoothly. Um, another big issue is that right after one of these mega fires, um, which, you know, burn people's homes, cars, and all sorts of toxic substances, you end up with all of this toxic ash. And then when the rains come, this toxic ash can go into our waterways and wreak all sorts of havoc on the salmon and aquatic species. Um, so there's a group of us at Co Renewal that's um, starting to put together a project of setting up these wattles, um, which can act as a biological filter um, and when they're inoculated with fungi, um, or maybe when they're not, where you need to do an experiment because nobody's really looked at this, um, to see, you know, how we can um, filter these toxins as they're going into the waterways. Um, and this is also a way that we can support the land retaining water, um, which obviously we really need, and make the landscape more fire resilient um, for the future. Um, and I like this because it's uh, an emergency response, which is essential, but we're also considering the long-term environmental health. Um, we're hoping to get this project together by the end of the summer if we can find the funding for it. So I'd like us to imagine again here for a moment that we are that, like that web of mycelium that we spoke about at the beginning. And we're meeting a new situation um, and it could be harmful to us, except this time, you know, we're facing catastrophic wildfires. Um, and some of the questions I have here are, you know, how can we work with our ancestral wisdom um, and the ancestral wisdom of this land, the indigenous people, the indigenous fungi, mushrooms like morels, which grow after fires, or pyronema cup fungi that grow after fires. And how can we bring that together with, you know, some of our cutting edge technology and fungal genetics um, and, and other resources that we have and adapt that to the current situation and the changing climate. Um, I'm interested in uh, what other tools we can use and how, what we can bring together. Um, we have this incredible uh, network in California that's starting to grow of grassroots bioremediators um, who are doing really beautiful work. Um, so one of the ways that um, I've been exploring these questions um, and it's obviously an ongoing conversation, uh, but it has been through the Fire and Fungi Study Group, which I started um, in order to, to explore these topics. And so we've got 
these um, you know PhD scientists, and we've got grassroots remediators, and we've been bringing to bringing forth some indigenous voices to really try to understand this situation. And actually, today's um, an exciting day because this group has transformed from a study group into a support group for uh, getting some projects to move forward. Um, and uh, I'm really excited about all of the new um, projects and things that are going to come out of this. Um, we're also going to kick off a speaker series and do more education and outreach around these topics that I'm really excited about. So um, I want to, um, I have to get going, but I wanted to invite you all to connect with us, check out corenewal.org, just check us out on Facebook, um, donate if you can, um, or connect in whatever way you feel is right. Um, I think it's really important in these times to just go out in the forest and make friends with the fungi and make friends with the plants um, and find your, um, your home in the forest um, that really does want you as a human to interact with it. Um, my hope is that um, as we connect with other people and we connect with our ecosystem um, and we connect with the fungi, we can be building our capacity to heal the wounds of our past, learn from our past, so that we can um, uh, continue to support life on earth and decolonize our minds, bodies, communities, and land. So thank you all so much. I think I've got two minutes for questions. Um, Christina, did you have uh, want to show me some questions? Um, Christina, wondering if there are questions. And if not, we can just move on. Oh, there's one up there. Trying to see the questions, I'm sorry, y'all. Oh, question from Mark. Um, are the mycelium helping to restore CO2 emissions or adding to emissions? So, um, so fungi are like animals, right? In that they breathe in oxygen and they breathe out CO2. That's how they function. Most of the CO2 that fungi release um, in a forest um, is gonna be absorbed right away by the plants and isn't really adding anything uh, of significance to the overall um, carbon emissions um, that we're we're putting out. Um, that said, um, I think it's also important to keep in mind that um, without these fungi, we wouldn't have plants. And without plants, there is no life and there's nobody taking in that carbon. So their overall impact on climate, I think is very, very positive. Uh, question. Someone wanted to know how to join the group you talked about too. Go to corenewal.org. Um, if you're wanting to get involved, you can shoot us an email um, and uh, and we'll be in touch. And then one more. Do mushrooms take up toxins from the soil like dangerous heavy metals? Yes. So, you know, like I was talking about, fi fungi can biodegrade petroleum um, and many of the components of petroleum and turn it into soil. Heavy metals, however, don't biodegrade. Uh, but there are a lot of ways that fungi can hyperaccumulate heavy metals and actually put them into their mushrooms, their fruiting bodies, um, which then you would have to figure out a way to dispose of those. Um, and there are also um, our buscular mycorrhizae. We have another project that I didn't talk about, which is also very exciting, um, which is looking at ways that our buscular mycorrhizae can uh, help lock heavy metals in the soil, in agricultural soils particularly, and make it less bioavailable to the plants. So if you have a heavy metal contaminated landscape and you're trying to grow food, um, we're really interested in how we can um, keep those heavy metals from getting into the food. Um, so I think that's it. Thank you all so much. This was a lot of fun. Take good care. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, William Padilla Brown, and I'm happy to be here. Um, yeah, um, for those of you that don't know about me, check the Instagram or it's over, I don't know how to backwards on the webcam, but yeah, check out the Instagram um, and uh, you can learn a little bit more about me. But um, due to the amount of time that we have today, I want to make sure that we get into this because I got a lot of interesting things to share with you. And I want to say, and uh, show respects to the late, great uh, Gary Linkoff. I'm channeling my inner Gary Linkoff with my little 
foraging vests. I never saw that man without a foraging vest on. Um, but yeah, uh, without further ado, I'm here to talk to you guys about my research uh, with cordyceps mushrooms. I've been cultivating cordyceps mushrooms for about five years now. Um, and I published the first literature in English that was an, that was not a uh, research paper on cultivating cordyceps. And since then, there's been an incredible boom in cordyceps cultivation in the United States. Um, so we'll get into a little bit about what I've been doing recently over the past year, which is more focused on breeding cordyceps militaris for the ever growing community of cordyceps farmers. Um, we want to make sure that we have some solid genetics. Um, with other forms of mushroom cultivation, um, with the big farms that we he have here in Pennsylvania, um, almost all of the mushrooms that, they're, that are being cultivated are commercial genetics that were bred out to be high yielding, um, specific color, specific flavor profiles and things like that. Um, so this is something that is um, a necessity with cordyceps uh, mushrooms and the whole breeding of cordyceps mushrooms is a fairly new um, thing that only about three of my friends are working on right now. Um, so a little bit about the overview of what I'm doing. Um, I have a lab here in my home. Um, I'm a big proponent of uh, citizen science. I think that all of us have the potential, especially with mycology, um, to discover something new um, and to work on really interesting things. So um, I set up this lab here in my basement. I'm literally sitting above it right now um, where I do all of this work. So I just really want to emphasize the fact that anybody can get into this and anybody can start doing these kinds of things. Um, so what I'm doing regularly is looking for parent cultures. Um, so what that means for me is going out into the woods here in Pennsylvania and searching for wild genetics. So luckily I live in an area where cordyceps mushrooms are um, prevalent um, and they grow um, in a couple different areas around where I live. Um, oddly enough, this year, they aren't as productive um, in the wild right now. I haven't really seen many and they should have been out about a month ago. Um, but that doesn't mean they're not there. That just means I need to um, start reassessing what I'm looking for because uh, because of their association and relationship with insects, um, the insects life cycle um, has a big role to play and uh, where they will be or uh, when they will be there and so on and so forth. So I do believe I do need to learn a little bit more about insects to have a better grasp on uh, finding these cordyceps in the wild. Um, so what I do when I once I find a parent culture, which is a wild specimen for me, um, finding a parent culture could mean um, purchasing a culture from somebody else, um, depending on your situation. Um, I isolate spores from the parent culture um, determine the mating types of isolated spores, um, which was something I had to teach myself how to do uh, via molecular biology and working with PCR and gel electrophoresis. Um, when, when we're dealing with fungi, we have to understand that their mating types and their sexual orientation, so to speak, are much different than ours. We have male and female, um, and some fungi have thousands of mating types. Cordyceps uh, militaris is what we'll be talking about mostly today. Luckily, only has three different uh, mating types, and um, two of them are incompatible, and the one is compatible with the other two. Um, I figure out what the mating types are. I combine opposite mating types. I test new strains, um, note the traits of the offsprings, and then go back and combine isolated spores with desirable traits, and then repeat that process. Um, so we'll keep going here. Um, so finding parent strains in the wild is probably the most fun part about it because I just love getting out in the woods. Um, when we're looking for cordyceps, I generally look for hemlock oak mix forest, um, typically with water uh, moving through it. Um, they really seem to be more prevalent around creeks and they really um, seem to be more prevalent around um, dry creek beds or uh, where the water flows through the forest when it rains, but those um, those areas where the water isn't always there, um, they really tend to be more uh, accumulated in those areas. Um, so I go out, I look for these specific types of forest, um, and then I just get my eyes on and search for those little differences in the greens and the browns, because um, we're searching for mushrooms that are generally smaller than your pinky finger. Um, 
once I find these mushrooms, I dig them up and I do my first analysis, uh, which is to make sure that the host species isn't the host uh, isn't broken. Um, if the host is broken, um, that generally means that there's going to be mites inside of the host. And that's something you do not want to bring into your laboratory. Mites are one of the biggest pests uh, when it comes to cordyceps cultivation because they will actually eat the mycelium, um, which I do believe has a beneficial ecological role as cordyceps are so small and their host is also so small that they have to have various measures of being able to um, propagate into the next year and continue on. So I do believe that the mites help to move their mycelium through the forest in a natural setting, but in a cultivated setting, it's, uh, it's kind of a nuisance because um, they'll eat your mycelium. Um, another thing that's really interesting to note that really doesn't necessarily have to do with the breeding of cordyceps is that Cordyceps mushrooms and cordyceps type mushrooms um, are some of the only organisms we know of in, in this planet that are capable of uh, what we call morphing. Um, they have a phase uh, that we call anamorphing, uh, where they'll change into a completely different species. So um, cordyceps militaris can change into a soil mold, which I believe is really interesting because the host species that they're associated with um, bury themselves in the soil. So if the spores don't have the opportunity to land on another insect, there are cordyceps existing as soil mold species that can come in contact with the insect when it buries itself. And what really solidified that idea for me was um, I was speaking with a colleague and friend, Daniel Winkler, who is also very well versed in cordyceps. And he explained to me that the Ophiocordyceps sin uh, sinensis or sinensis in uh, the Himalayan mountains will actually uh, morph into an endophyte and live inside of the leaves of the plant that its host species eats. So these cordyceps have various ways of getting themselves integrated uh, into the ecosystem and also getting themselves into their host species. Um, so not just the spores. Um, so I go out there, I find these wild uh, mushrooms. Um, there's a few different host species, but the most common species that we're seeing in Pennsylvania is um, Anisona, Anisoda senatoria, which is a oak worm moth. So that's probably why we're seeing them in these oak hemlock mixed forests. But I don't often see them in just oak forests. Doesn't I'm not saying that they're not there. I have found them in just oak forests, but it seems that that hemlock mix is uh, really beneficial. So there's still a lot to learn as far as the ecological role of the Cordyceps militaris. Um, so this is some of the areas where I find them. Sometimes they're in the moss, sometimes they're in the leaf litter, sometimes they're just growing right out of soil. I found them in sand. I found them in between gravel before. Um, it really just depends on where the insect puts itself. Um, so we go out there um, generally with a tackle box um, so that we can keep them separated because one of the things that I don't want happening is them dropping spores on each other. I don't want one specimen dropping spore on another specimen because whenever I go to extract the spore, I might get spores from two different specimens, which if I'm doing my isolations of the spores correctly, they won't combine. Um, but it's just something I don't want to happen. So I try to keep them separated. Um, before I put them into the tackle box, I generally walk around with them in my hand um, because when you disturb them, they start to eject spores. Um, so I let them spread their spores out into the open air before I put them into the tackle box. Um, so another way you can get a parent culture is to buy a strain from somebody. And um, the two other sources I'd recommend besides myself would be um, Appalachian Gold, uh, which is my friend Jeff uh, out here in Pittsburgh and terrestrial fungi, which is my friend Ryan Paul Gates out in Michigan. Um, both of them are breeding cordyceps and actively go and find uh, wild cordyceps. Um, I see that there's a question here um, from Aaron asking, when I cultivate in my lab, what hosts are you using and why? Um, when I cultivate cordyceps, I don't use insects. I use a gluten-free, uh, soy-free, sugar-free, um, rice-based substrate. Um, and uh, they take, they've taken very well to that. What we're kind of doing is trying to mimic the nutritional profile of an insect, but they don't necessarily need insects to grow. And that's not the case with all cordyceps. I believe cordyceps militaris is uh, more easily cultivated on non-insect substrates just due to the fact that it's the most successful cordyceps species out of all cordyceps and cordyceps type species in the sense that it grows on almost 50 different insect hosts. So we've seen cordyceps militaris um, generally on Lepidioptera and Coleoptera, so like beetles, moths, and butterfly on all, on all stages of their life from larva to adult stage. Um, but they are very successful cordyceps in the diversity of, of host species. So they um, take a little bit better to being cultivated on non-insect um, substrates. 
Um, so we isolate the spores from the parent strain. I generally do this by um, utilizing Vaseline or Waxoline, um, which is a beeswax Vaseline alternative, which I'd recommend over petroleum based product. Um, and we stick the uh, stroma, which is the fruiting body of the cordyceps to the top of a Petri dish and allow it to eject its spores. So generally, depending on how vigorous um, the mushroom is, because some of them just eject an insane, an insane amount of spore in a short period of time. Some of them, it takes a little bit longer. So I generally keep an eye on it and I'll go check on it. And this is something that I have to be at home for a couple days to do. I can't just do this if I'm traveling. Um, I'll generally go check on the Petri dishes every couple hours. Um, and, and I've trained myself to be able to see it without a microscope, but if you need to, you can utilize a microscope to see if it has dropped any spores. Um, once it starts to drop spores, I'll generally just take the Petri dish lid and I'll twist it. So it starts dropping spores in a different area. Um, and then after about 12 to 24 hours, I'll, I'll remove the mushroom or the stroma from the Petri dish and I'll look at the spores underneath the microscope. At this point, you can go one or two ways. You can do uh, serial dilutions, which I don't recommend because ascospores, um, cordyceps militaris is an ascomycete, like Gordon mentioned earlier. It's not, um, it's not a basidiomycete, so the spores aren't like little seed-looking um, structures. They're, they're like little shards of glass, um, and they can break. Um, so with serial dilutions, I've noticed that the spores break more often. Um, so what I do is I look underneath the microscope, I find the spore and typically I let it germinate a little bit so that it's easier to see. Um, and you can see on the right, the picture on the right that the spore has germinated. You can see mycelium starting to come out of the spore and I'll go in there um, with a scalpel and I'll pull that out, which requires a delicate hand um, and a really well-trained eye. Um, but once I get the spore out, I put it in its own Petri dish. Um, and then I expose it to light. Cordyceps militaris mycelium, when exposed to light, will produce an orange pigment, um, which I believe it's to protect itself, but there's not much evidence backing that at this point. Um, but they'll also produce fruiting bodies when exposed to light. So if I messed up and already combined two spores, you'll see like on the picture on the left, it's starting to produce fruiting bodies on the Petri dish. Um, so once I know that I have a single spore, what I'll do is I'll get all of my spores together um, I'll take piece of the, I'll take a piece of the mycelium and I'll run it through polymerase, cha uh, polymerase chain reaction machine. I have a little mini PCR. It's a very affordable PCR. Um, and I have a video on YouTube if anybody wants to learn more about this process spe specifically. Um, but I, um, extract the DNA from the mycelium. I amplify the DNA and then I run it through gel electrophoresis, phoresis, which, um, gives me a visual of, of the DNA. So what I do before I, um, I put the specimen into the PCR is I add primers, uh, which are utilized to isolate specific regions of DNA. Um, I add primers that will um, isolate the mating type regions of the DNA. So I typically do it, I said there's three mating types. Um, two of those mating types are on one locust. So I'll run a primer that will, um, show me that locust and then I'll run a primer that shows me the other. Um, so we call them mat one and mat two. Um, and then when I run them on gel electrophoresis, um, you can see here that almost only every other um, well is showing a little highlighted bar here. Um, so for the first two wells, I have one specimen from a Petri dish that I ran both mating types. So because only one of them lit up means that I for sure have only one um, isolated spore there. There's not two spores or it'd be combined and there'd be two um, glowing little lines. Um, but because there's only one means that um, there's one mating type, it's a single spore. And because it's on the left side, that means that it's a mating type one. So if this, if the second bar would have been lit up, it would have been mating type two. So for every two wells, I have a different sample. Um, and once I know what the mating types are, then I can take the mat one and combine it with the mat two. And I'll generally do that with all of the specimens that I have. I'll combine all of them. Um, and then I'll begin to test these strains, to see how quickly they fruit, how much they yield. Um, oh, geez, I got a two minute warning here. Um, so I'll wrap it up really quick. Um, I see how good they look, how well they're yielding. Um, and then I find which parent strains have the most desirable off, uh, offspring. And I'll combine the parent strains with the most desirable offspring. So you can see a lot of different variations here. 
of, uh, of different breeding projects that I've done. Um, so yeah, I go back, I combine towards with desirable traits. Um, and, uh, that's how I breed cordyceps really. Um, eventually you get to the point where you have your best parent strains, you combine them together and you get really, really amazing, um, yielding and amazing looking strains. And eventually once we get better with the analytic side side of things, um, we'll be able to see which strains are producing the most compounds. So if you want to learn more, um, my book is being printed right now, the Cordyceps Cultivation Handbook Volume 2 that covers everything and much more um, than what I talked about today. Um, so yeah, I'll be back a little bit in a little bit to talk uh, to sing you guys one of my songs or rap you guys one of my songs. I really appreciate you guys listening today um, and definitely follow at Symbiote to learn more. Hey, Peter, I just wanted to say you're, you're muted. <laughs> okay, I got to unmute myself. Cool. Uh, my name is Peter, and I'm the founder of Mycologos, the world's first online uh, and in-person mycology school, as well as Radical Mycology, an organization started in the early 2000s to build what I like to call the mycoculture through combining art and education and mycology through sharing um, information, have, hosting events, and building up a symbolic and cultural language around all that fungi offer us. Um, I have an extensive background in art and music myself, and getting interested in mycology when I was younger, there wasn't a lot of art uh, in mycology that I could really relate to. So it's been a sort of life passion to make fungi cool and represent that through visual art and support and encourage other people to do the same. Um, I've written a book by the title of Radical Mycology, goes into some of my philosophy around all this, um, and also host a online, or excuse me, an in-person event every other year with several other people called the Radical Mycology Convergence. At that event, we do lots of things, including for the last two convergences, host an international art show called Mush Love, as well as a Saturday night talent show where all the participants can share their passions, uh, whether they relate to fungi or not. Out of that talent show, we've definitely had a lot of really great art and music and performances that sometimes incorporated fungi. And so in one of the years that we were not hosting a convergence, because it happens every other year, I uh, decided to put together a mixtape project and to put out a call and to see if we'd get submissions from people uh, making anything audible related to fungi or inspired by fungi. And sure enough, we got dozens of submissions from around the world. And at the end of the submission window, me and a group of people selected the most representative spread. And my friend Madeline did the um, album artwork. And my <clears throat> friend and studio mate did the final mastering. And my friend did a video mix for the entire thing, uh, which I'll play clips of right now. The first clip is from two pieces together. And the first piece is from an artist, M.G. Sparrow, who I stumbled across researching for the project, who coincidentally in their own work hadn't heard of radical mycology and the sort of metaphors we like to bring combining fungi and society and sociology. Uh, but through their own thinking had all this metaphorical relationships between mycelium, fungal growth and radical social movements. And uh, they made a whole audio project in a, in a poem or a chat book around this. And so we have a bunch of excerpts from that. And the second piece is from a hardcore crust punk band from Wisconsin who made a song called Radical Mycology Time. In nearly every country, in numerous urban landscapes, in fact, in most places, opportunities of finding the movement occurs. Go back to the 
Right on. Um, that one made me laugh when we got it on the last day of the submission window. Uh, the next track is from Zoe Gordon, who apparently had written a and made a 20 minute experimental audio piece after mushrooms invaded her brains and she was having uh, or dreams rather and was having dreams about mushrooms being aliens and they wanted to communicate through her. And out of that, she felt compelled to initially make a children's poem, which it turned into this whole 20 minute audio project. And it sat on her SoundCloud for several years until she heard about the Mixtape Project and submitted it. And we pulled two snippets that are on the album. This is one of them. That night I ate morels like you've never seen. Morels the size of hands. Morels that haunt my dreams. We are the mushrooms. We are not just morsels in the pot. We are the aliens. We've come to help you out. There's several other non-music tracks on the album, but definitely the majority is music. And a number of the songs are essentially odes to mushroom foraging or mycophagy, eating mushrooms. Uh, arguably one of the most catchy songs is called Mushroom Eye by one of the members of the Illinois Mycological Society. Yo, I will put you in my mushroom basket. Sorted carefully in my mushroom basket. I will put you in my mushroom basket So don't try to hide Don't try to hide You are destined for my mushroom pot Some of you will make a tasty stock Oh, here's a mushroom that I must not eat Here's a mushroom that I must not eat Take a photograph but do not eat so don't try to hide. Don't try to hide. The next track is probably one of my favorite on the album. It comes from a band out of San Francisco called Glitter Wizard. And I actually came across the track after going to or at a roadshow house um, the Saturday night after presenting at an herbalism conference in Colorado. And I'm hanging out and I hear the chorus of one of these songs from the psych rock band saying mycelia, mycelia. And I looked them up. And sure enough, that was the name of the song. And I messaged them and said, hey, can we put this song on this album? And they sent a one word response email that said yes. And so we put it on. Um, and luckily enough, or oddly enough, I found out that one of the other presenters at that same conference, the Herbalism Conference, uh, had a child named Mycelia. And she knew the band. And they actually wrote the song based on her daughter. Send me sick of love and nature that are lost from the annals of man. Mysteries and a hidden history that are older than we understand. I can hear you whispering under the ground. I get electric chills from the awesome sound. There's many different genres on the album from melodic uh, uh, beats with no vocals, um, as well as a lot of singer songwriter type songs. This next song was written by the artist immediately after seeing a radical mycology workshop that I gave in Maine several years ago. And it's about their relationship to their garden and sort of what fungi mean there. The fungus is seldom only what you see, that's just the fruiting body. Beneath the surface there are networks of vast cooperation, sharing nutrients, moisture, and information. The mycelial structure isn't rational, though it's certainly intelligent and probably thoughtful. It expands and contracts in a cyclical pattern, and no single entity controls it. 
Everything is always a work in progress. Everything is always a work in progress. Everything is always a work in progress. And nothing's ever finished till it's gone. There's also a number of tracks uh, inspired by or written under the influence of psychoactive fungi, most of which I'll leave for you to discover. Um, but the final track on the album is by a celloist from Montreal, simply titled Psilocybe. It is true, they often occur in unexpected situations, and from their extreme rapidity of development, seem as if they could not have originated from anything. I believe that the intersections between mycology and art is one of the most critical at this point in the expansion of the mycoculture. Uh, for all that fungi offer us, all their potential benefits, all their amazing, unique features, um, it won't really spread and reach you know more people unless we have again this sort of cultural language, I think, and and the art forms that we can really hold on to as a as a cultural point of reference for our appreciation and understanding of the more analytical and science side of things, which is also uh, of great value. Uh, we do have plans to do another mixtape project, so if you're into the audio arts, keep an uh, ear out for that. Um, but for this year, we're putting energy into the world's first short film festival dedicated to fungi, the Fungi Film Festival, which, like the mixtape project, will be community sourced. So go to fungifilmfest.com to check out that and to submit any quality and type of short film you like, as long as it relates in some way to fungi. Um, thanks to the California Academy of Sciences for having me and to all the other speakers. And thanks to all of you for learning and furthering your path uh, down the world of mycology. Oh, what's up, guys? It's me again. Um, so the folks with the uh, California Academy um, asked me to share my other talents, uh, which include music, among other things. And um, I don't necessarily make songs specifically um, about mushrooms, um, but I do hope you guys enjoy um, the vibes. Um, so I'll perform one of my songs here, and then um, I think we have a little time to answer some more questions. So. Even though it's not fungi related, I hope you guys enjoy. Dices, dices. Can you really for me make it lucky for me? Right, just I might just Roll it up, roll it up, let's get to it, having fun Are you digging on this energy, we move it She gone, that's the bomb, what's percolating? Cross your legs, take a breath, now we meditating Burn it down, burn it down, to the ashes, that's that magic Rise like Phoenix, double helix, that's just twisting me in Taking trips out to Venice, right with Europeans Gladiator cheeks like we in the college. Can you show me paradise? It's nice. Can you roll it for me? Make it lucky for me. You're right. It's a mic. Take a gamble on you. Take it. Can you show me paradise? It's nice. Can you roll it for me? Make it lucky for me. You're right. It's a mic. Take a gamble on you. You. Take a gamble on you, make me miss my fire. Starry eye when you come through, let you be my new guru. Could you teach me that voodoo? You are gold, you need it to find as you be true. 
righteous. Can you roll it for me? Make it lucky for me. Righteous, I'm righteous. Take a gamble on you. Can you show me paradises? Dices. Can you roll it for me? Make it lucky for me. Righteous, I'm righteous. Take a gamble on you. Can you really show me that you're riding like this? You and your gang got me geeking when you're doing those splits. Too close, need a house the way you're moving in Swiss. Taking trips with friends where your son is when we just The way the world's turning now, got us questioning it. Quick revisions with precision, we'll be making it bliss. Like the way I lose my focus when you move in the ribs. Hypnotic, so melodic, just the way you exist. Dices, dices. Can you roll it for me? Make it lucky for me. You're right, just I might just take a gamble on you. Take a gamble on you. Dices, can you roll it for me? Make it lucky for me. You're right, just I might just take a gamble on you. Take a gamble on you. Can you show me paradises, dices? Can you roll it for me, make it lucky for me? You're right, it's a mic. Can you show me paradises, dices? Can you roll it for me, make it lucky for me? You're right, it's a mic. Take a game of you. Yeah, so that song was called Paradise Dices. Um, it's uh, the first song on my upcoming album entitled Yod. Um, if anybody is interested in the music, I have a separate Instagram account for the music. It's it's called It's Cosmic Music. Um, I try and keep the science and the music separated, but sometimes, you know, it intermingles. Um, so I don't know if you all wanted me to go for more time or if you wanted me to answer more questions. I have plenty of music if you want another one. Um, and I also have plenty of knowledge if you want me to answer any questions. So um, if the kind folks uh, with California Academy would uh, let me know if I should answer some questions or do another song, um, I'm here for whatever. And I hope you guys enjoyed that. All right. Well, seems that they want me to do another. Um, so let's see. I'll do one more for you guys. Um, this one I actually just finished um, and it has one of my friends um, singing on it as well. But I think this one's pretty fun as well. On the ranges, you know that soul is so stainless. Blessings from El Alohano, we live a life that's so taboo. So many faces, take a step out of the cages. I put a lead on my demons, tame them with smoke of the sages. Evening light like it's Vegas, said I'm on her nerve and it's Vegas. And she is a pagan, walk around naked in that oasis, bathing in greatness. No, well, she blessed me, but did I deserve it? Walking with wizards, that's why I name us a Merlin. Now I love the taste of this life, oh, the taste of that flora. And you keep emitting that light, oh, and I'm tasting that aura. You know that that feeling's right, yeah, that feeling's in sorrow. So you know that that feeling's right, yeah, we do what we want to do. Now I love the taste of this life, oh, the taste of that flora. And you keep emitting that light, oh, and I'm tasting that aura. And you know that that feeling's right. Yeah, that feeling is samsara. I said, you know that that feeling is right. Yeah, we do what we want to do. I'm feeling that ambiance. I'm up a cuddle of champions. I'm feeling like I'm a champion. I'm living in a new house again. She got that sting like a scorpion. She got that sting to bring happiness. She got that taste, got me ravenous. We off that poison, that basilisk. And I love the taste of the beach, yeah. The taste of the sea, huh? And she got that taste by the freak, yeah. So tasteful to me, huh? And I love the taste of the tree, oh, the taste 
to that timber. Capping the stem and I'm tasting these colors. I love the taste of your shimmer. And I love the taste of this life. Oh, the taste of that flora. And you keep emitting that light. Oh, and I'm tasting that aura. And you know that that feeling is right. Yeah, that feeling is sorrow. I say, you know that that feeling is right. Yeah, we do what we want to do. And I love the taste of this life. Oh, the taste of that flora. And you keep emitting that light. Oh, and I'm tasting that aura. And you know that that feeling is right. Yeah, that feeling is sorrow. I say, you know that that feeling is right. Yeah, we do what we want to do. Oh my god, that's so much fun. I can't wait till post COVID so I can actually perform this, you know. Um, but yeah, I really appreciate you guys, and that album will be dropping very soon. Again, follow Michael Symbiote for um all of the science follow its cosmic music for all the music and other fun vibes and again the cordyceps cultivation handbook uh is in print right now and will be shipping out very very soon so i really appreciate the uh california academy of sciences for having me on um this was a lot of fun and i hope that everybody tuned in um maybe has a chance to come out to one of our events or interact in some other way um so yeah many blessings Hi, everyone. Thanks to Gordon, Maya, William, and Peter for presenting with us tonight. Um, everyone, please make sure to follow their work. And thanks for joining us. Yeah, and um, yeah, we put links in the description for the in the YouTube video. So please go visit their sites, follow them, um, and ask them more questions about the work that than we had time for today. And next week, we are back with frogs. And then the week after that, we are doing a very full space program. So we hope you will join us and um, have a good night, everybody. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>